The following show is brought to you in part by Not Me in Arlington, Massachusetts. Not Me is a nonprofit organization with a mission to promote, advance, and unify self defense education and training for at risk populations. Visit Not Me at www.not-me.org. We're here today at 17 Piedmont Street, Boston. Today, just a parking lot, but once the site of the Coconut Grove, Boston's premier nightclub from its construction in the 1920s, tragically, on November 28, 1942, became forever known as the site of the deadliest nightclub fire in U.S. history, killing 492 people. I'm here today with Stephanie Choreau, freelance writer, journalist, and author of six books all about Boston. So what better guess for this segment of About Boston? Stephanie's resume includes a journalism degree from Northwestern University, master's degree from NYU. She's also vice president of the board of the Boston Fire Historical Society and enjoys working as a clay potter at the Mud Flat Studio in Somerville, Mass. Stephanie, thank you for speaking with us Thanks today. Thanks so much for inviting me here. Right. Tell me, what was your motivation to start the research for your book, The Coconut Grove Fire? Well, The Coconut Grove Fire has been just such a chapter in Boston history. Um, I first started, I knew about it, but I first started researching it when I was doing my book called Boston on Fire, History of Fires and Firefighting. And at that time, um, I included it as a chapter uh, in that book. And, but the more I researched, researched it, the more intrigued I got. It is a never-ending story. It just, you, you go further and further into the lives of the people who are affected, how the city was affected, how, how manslaughter law was affected, how burn treatments were affected, and also the cause of the fire, which remains a mystery to this day. So it's something that just continues to intrigue me. For our viewers who, who don't know the story, could you just sort of revisit the sure. history of the events leading up to it? So the, night, the, the Coconut Grove nightclub was an extremely popular place. It was uh, created, uh, founded, if you will, in 1927 uh, by a couple of uh, entertainment entrepreneurs. Uh, they took a former uh, film distribution center, former gas station, and turned it into a glamorous night spot that riffed on the theme of the Coconut Grove. It was modeled after the Coconut Grove in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. So they opened up in 1927 to a lot of acclaim. Uh, but they ran into one big problem in terms of making a profit. This is 1927. Yeah. I always ask my audience, can they guess what that is? And of course, the answer is prohibition. People right. couldn't get a drink. Right. So unfortunately, the, the guys just couldn't make it a profit. So in 1931, they sold out to a guy named Charles Solomon. King Solomon was called. He was kind of a gangster. And I think that's oh. putting it mildly. <laughs> and he ran the place until 1933, in which he, and he was uh, unfortunately assassinated by, in a gangland hit. But he started one particularly bad habit about this nightclub, and that was to keep the doors locked from the inside, from the outside. He didn't want people running out on, his bill, on their bills, didn't want people sneaking in. Wow. After his death, the club passed over to a guy named Barney Wolanski, who was uh, Solomon's lawyer. And Barney expanded the club, made it quite profitable, ran it like a real business. He added uh, a downstairs lounge called the Melody Lounge. And then about 10 days before the fire, he opened up a new part of the club, the Broadway Lounge, which is just okay. behind me over, over here, here right? um, where um, he put in another area for people to drink, hear music, hang out. The main entrance of the club was just a little bit uh, behind where we're standing right now, which is where the infamous revolving doors I were see. located. So the club extended all along this block that we're standing mm -hmm. on right now. Now, I understand that the, uh, there were other events going on the weekend of this fire. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, this, the, the, um, the weekend of the uh, Coconut Grove fire was actually a big one in Boston. There was a very major football game, at least for Boston, and that was the Holy Cross Boston College game. Right. And Boston College was assumed to win, and was actually, of course, they were going to win this game. Right. But, and the game was played in Fenway Park, interestingly really? enough. There was a football game in, in Fenway Park. 
unfortunately, or, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, Boston College lost 55 to 12 to Holy Cross. And so many uh, people at Boston College canceled their plans to go out and celebrate that night at the Coconut Grove. Wow. Whereas a lot of people who were fans of Holy Cross went out for the evening, and many of them went to the Coconut Grove that wow. night. Wow, isn't that awful, awful, awful. Yeah. Um, how did the fire allegedly start, and why, why were so many people killed in this fire? Well, that's a, it's, it's always been a bit of a mystery about the cause of the fire. Officially, it's unsolved. But we do know this, around 10, 10, 15, down in the Melody Lounge, which was that downstairs lounge I was talking about, uh, a soldier and his girlfriend reached, uh, the soldier was hanging out with his girlfriend, mm -hmm. soldier or sailor, we're not quite sure, reached up into a palm tree, there's a lot of fake palm trees. Right. And he unscrewed a little light bulb that was in the palm tree. He was trying, he was goofing around, he wanted a little more right. dark. Bartender saw that, said, hey buddy, you can't do that. So he said to the busboy, a guy named Stanley Tomachevsky, right. 15 years old, go and put the light bulb back in. Right. Stanley went over, tried to put the light bulb back in, couldn't find the socket. So he lit a match to find the socket and put the bulb back in. Wow. And that's when the palm tree caught on fire. Now there's a lot of feelings. Did that match actually cause the fire? Because almost immediately after the palm tree caught fire, the ceiling of the Melody Lounge was just covered by cloth. There was a cloth ceiling, right. caught fire. And suddenly there was a huge fireball that engulfed the Melody Lounge. Right. That fireball moved up the stairs, went out, literally went out of the lounge, upstairs into the main dining area, kind of an area of just a little bit behind where we are, okay. spread through that area right. and spread into the new lounge, that right. new place. Right. And this all happened in the space of like 10 to 15 minutes. It was right. just spread incredibly quickly. That was the cause of the fire. We think the match might have been the cause of the fire. The cause of the deaths was the unsafe conditions that the club was held in. For example, most of the exits had something function functionally wrong with them. They were locked from the inside to the outside. Right. There were no lighted exits so people could see what was going on. Right. The revolving door, which is where many people went, jammed. People right. couldn't get out there. The door into the Broadway lounge, the new lounge, opened inward with the flow of traffic so right. people pushed up against it and pushed it shut. Right. People caught there. So the huge loss of life can be attributed to the, to the unsafe or the, the lack of exits and the lack of codes. The, crowd, the club, for example, was way over its allotted number of people that night. It was licensed for about 500 people. There were at least 1,000 people in the okay, club so that night. So there were code violations, were code. number of people about the combustibility of the ceiling material. Well, the, that's, that's interesting because there was a lot of blame placed on the combustible material in the club, the, the palm, fake palm trees, the leatherette covering, uh, other things. But if you look at pictures, of the club after the fire, a lot of that stuff didn't burn. You still see palm trees right, there. Right. So um, there's some question, was that the cause of the flame? Now many firefighters will say, yes, things get combustible, they move, it moves very quickly, uh, and that can cause a fire. But the Coconut Grove, there was not what they call a flashover. In the, the Rhode Island nightclub, for yes, example. You, the it, station nightclub. St station nightclub, right. burned to the ground, caught right. fire, flashover, everything in it burned. Right. The coconut grove inside did not achieve that. It was like a fireball, an accelerator that moved through the club mm -hmm. and then was relatively quickly put out by firefighters. So there's, there's a lot of mysteries ab about that. So the but response to the, to the, from the fire department was fairly, fairly, fairly quick? quickly. Weird coincidence. The fire, there, were, there was a, a fire tr uh, company just a few blocks away from the club right. just a few minutes before the fire. They were putting out an automobile fire. So when they got the call, and actually they heard it, and someone ran down the street, they sort of backed their rig up and came right. right to So one fire company came to this side, the Piedmont Street right. side. Right. Another company went to the other side behind us, which is the Shawmut Street side. So actually right. they came, I, it took them a while to realize there were two companies there, right. one on one side, one on the other, and they made a valiant effort to put out right. the fire and attempt to rescue people. Unfortunately, the revolving drawers jammed and the firefighters came on the scene and they could see people in distress, people burning to death, mm -hmm. and they couldn't do anything about it. Wow. And many of the firefighters were haunted for the rest of their life by what wow. they saw that night. How awful. It brings back memories of the 9-11 uh, tragedy yes, it does. that we had. So in terms of the cause, the individual 
who um, supposedly started the fire. Were they uh, ever convicted or were they criminally charged? How did, how did the courts uh, deal with this? So it's interesting. Uh, Stanley Tomaszewski, the 15-year-old boy, um, who explained that he lit the match, um, the, officially he was exonerated. Offici he was. Officially he was exonerated. He was never um, charged. Uh -huh. The only people who were brought to trial, there are many people charged in, in this case, um, inspectors, the owner of the club, the owner's brother, who uh, the owner's brother who was there that night, and Barney Wolanski, who owned the club and who was actually in the hospital at the time. Mm -hmm. Only one person was ever convicted of anything to do with the club, and that was the owner of the club, Barney Wolanski. Okay. And this, his conviction, set precedent because um, he was convicted of manslaughter, and it was one of the first cases in which. Uh, it was shown that, or it was, it was held as an example, or a, that if you keep a place in unsafe conditions, yeah. you are liable for yes. deaths or injuries related to that place. Right. Criminally, criminally, criminally liable, responsible. criminally responsible. Okay. So um, the only one who was ever convicted was Barney Wojanski, who was sentenced to 12 to 15 years in jail. Did he serve that long? He no. He was he was um, pardoned by uh, Mayor Tobin. Uh, no, it was Governor Tobin, who had been mayor. Which is another issue. Yeah. He was pardoned, but he went home and he died in a couple months. He was very sick when he, he was, was pardoned. Yeah. He was. And how about the civil actions? Did the families of the uh, people who died, the victims or the seriously injured people? So, was unfortunately, uh, there was no insurance. Uh, Barney Wolanski did not have insurance on the club. Um, and they did find a huge cache of liquor that was hidden on the club. Uh huh which raised a lot of money. Unfortunately, the federal government stepped in and took it as back taxes. Really? The uh, victims of the Coconut Gov got maybe $100 each for $100. their- $100. $100 or less for their, for their sufferings. And they were, they were grievously, many of them were grievously injured. Now, at the time, many of them got free medical care because the situation was different. The Red Cross stepped in, helped them out. Um, hospitals were willing to donate, but in terms of the pain and suffering, it's amazing to think that today um, you could get away with not helping those people. And as a matter of fact, I had an interesting interview with the lawyer, the 90-year-old lawyer who helped to help represent those people. Mm -hmm. Not only what, did he represent them, but he got death threats. Really? He got death threats from someone unknown. Who was telling him to lay the, the for representing the victims unknown? There were many death threats. This is another mystery of the of the Grove. There were many death threats associated with the Grove after the fire. A reporter who was investigating the case was threatened. A state police detective or a state uh, official who was who was um, investigating the case. His children had to go to school under armed guard because mm -hmm. he got so many threats. Really? Um, one of the musicians who was originally involved with the club, a guy named Jacques Renard, I, this was after I published my book, but I found more information from her, which is included in my book called Drinking Boston, okay. which is a, a drinking history, but has even more stuff on the Coconut Grove, because really? I keep finding out more things. Really? But her, she described an incident when her mother was threatened right. by this. So wow. there, I am waiting, I am waiting for someone's deathbed confession. Who was behind all these death threats uh, uh, toward people involved with the investigation of the club, so many, after all these deaths, right. somebody had right. the, you know, nerve right. to call up and harass these people. Wow. And I think a lot of us, we can't figure it out. Right. I'm still waiting for someone to explain that to right. me. Well, the interesting part of this, in, in addition to that, is that there are many people still alive today who Mm -hmm. were alive in this in this period and right. I know you visit many uh, you know elder care elder facilities care, yeah. uh, and talk to some of the people and what kind of stories do you hear and what kind of coincidental things have you heard that that uh, just lend a little bit of a lighter uh, edge to this well, awful story one story I've heard over and over again and people listening to this broadcast will probably remember it. and this is a story um, some variation. My grandfather, my aunt, my uncle, my relative was going to go to the club that night, or it was at the club but then left, or it was there but couldn't get in, could not get in, and therefore did not experience the fire and was saved. And I've heard variations of that story over and over and over again. 
And the first 10 times I heard it, I was all excited. But then I started to think, how could this happen? Could all of Boston been going to the Coconut Grove that night? But then I realized that those stories add up to a greater truth, a greater truth about this fire. This fire affected everybody in Boston. Everybody felt it could have been them. It was a strike into the heart of the city. And we've seen this. We've seen this with the marathon bombing. I found myself after that terrible event saying, I was looking at the the shots of, of Copley Square and I was saying, I was just there. I was just there the week before and I felt that same sense of connection. So I think in the years to come, we'll have people talking about the marathon and they'll be saying I was just there or I left just before the bombs right. because it reflects that feeling of connection to a tragedy that affected all of Boston. Right. Absolutely. Any celebrities uh, that were involved yes. at the time in the facility? Yes, there was one major celebrity celebra- celebrity at the Coconut Grove that night and that was a gentleman named Buck Jones and Buck yeah. Jones was a cowboy star. Uh, who had starred in about 166 westerns. He was really well known, very popular. He had his own fan club. He had his own theme song. Um, and he, his, he had done, been in a lot of silent movies, but he also made the transition to the talkies. What he couldn't do was sing. And so he was really mad at Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and all those singing <laughs> cowboys. He didn't consider them real cowboys. Really? So he was actually in Boston that uh, that day, he was doing a bond drive, uh, helping to promote, like many celebrities do, helping to promote uh, civil uh, causes. Right. He was also promoting his, his movie. And it, it is really kind of tragic because he had a very full day of events. He was suffering from a cold, and he just wanted to go home to his hotel. In fact, he canceled his evening, uh, evening plans. But then people in the theater uh, industry in Boston prevailed on him and said, hey, we want to take you out to the best nightclub mm. in town. And so. He was rousted from his, he just said, okay, he was a good cowboy. He put on his boots right. and he went out to the Coconut Grove that night. But unfortunately, he, he, um, he was uh, died of, uh, a few days after the fire from his injuries. Awful, it does have so many similarities to the stories that we heard about mm-hmm. the marathon. And mm-hmm. Even those of us who never go to the race, we know we've been down that street and you know people do it it just affects people right right where they right where they live right, right where they live and, and uh, um, how how awful um well the uh recognition of this event is something that i know you feel mm-hmm. strongly about mm-hmm. there is currently a plaque which uh is right behind us the plaque reads as follows erected by the bay village association 1993 in memory of the more than 490 people who died in the Coconut Grove fire on November 28, 1942. As a result of that terrible tragedy, major changes were made in the fire codes and improvements in the treatment of burn victims, not only in Boston, but across the nation. Phoenix out of ashes. And I know, Stephanie, that um, the 75th anniversary of this event is coming up in, I guess, four years, approximately yeah, four, four approximately years. Four years. Mm-hmm. And there is a, um, a movement to create a larger and more permanent monument. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you want to speak to that a little yeah, bit? I think, I think it behooves Boston to create some sort of memorial for the victims of this fire because it had such a big impact on the city. Uh, I don't think it was memorialized at the time because we were in the middle of World War II and there were many, many horrible things going on there. But I think today, looking back, we can really trace a lot of um, uh, progress in the things that you mentioned, burn treatments, manslaughter law precedent, uh, even safety codes, um, so many other things to that fire. So, and, and more importantly, we owe it to the victims, these people who were out for a night on the town, families, 16-year-old girl, young men, sailors, soldiers, to say something about it. And, and, and I think we're starting to fully research the fire where there's a new uh, Coconut Grove um, archive, uh, something called the Coconut Grove Coalition that is being spearheaded by the National Fire Protection Association okay. that's bringing together a lot of this information about the fire, putting it online, online mm-hmm. making it accessible to students of the future. Okay. Um, Young students, uh, or even older students, are very interested in this fire. They're doing, right. they're touring articles on it. We need to continue those right. things. Also, on site, either on site or somewhere in Boston, it would be good to have a place 
for remembrance. Right. Something that gets people to think about right. what happened here Absolutely. and why Absolutely. and the consequences of, of things that um, like safety codes and right. having adequate exits right. and, knowing, and knowing where to go in an emergency. Right. Is there currently a committee set up to spearhead the? the yeah, there are, there are. There's a general. There's a few general uh, people, gentlemen, who are, are working on that. The Boston Fire Historical Society okay. is also very much involved with that. Okay. Um, so there's a few um, private citizens who have some real interest in this, who are really, really pushing this. Um, and the Boston Fire Historical Society. It's something we've been interested in a long time. We've explored um, the, the, uh, doing a monument here. Right. So it's something that that there's a lot of grassroots in, uh, interest in right now. Um, and we're looking to get something a little more formal. So if, if any of our viewers wanted to get involved in this movement to, to have the monument constructed, who, who would you recommend that they uh, well, I think, speak with? Well, I think that you should, uh, they should go to um, the boss, two, two places. One, um, I will set up a link on my website, which okay. is stephanieshoro.com. I'll make sure that's up yes, there. Yes, and we'll have that yep. uh, rolling at the right. end of our segment. And then, I, uh, then also I would encourage people to go to the Boston Fire Historical Society, okay. bostonfirehistory.org okay. um, site, uh, because we'll have a link there, and there's a lot of history about the fire there. Um, another site is the Coconut Grove Coalition, uh, I think if you just Google Coconut Grove Coalition, you'll find that that's Great. more background. Great. Sooner or later, all these will be linked up and we'll have a Great. specific committee. I think we're in the exploratory oh. stages now. Very worthwhile venture. I uh, think so. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd like you to talk just briefly, if you would, about uh, some of your other books. Uh, okay. I know um, and the one that jumped out at me was uh, Drinking Boston, yes, yeah. not because I partake in that, but it's just an interesting subject, a history Everyone of the likes. city and its spirits. What, yeah. what do you cover in that book? Well, in that book, that is a history, it's really a history of Boston as seen through its bars, its taverns, its speakeasies, its blind pigs, its um, local bar in the corner situation. But it's interesting uh, how much history you can find by tracing what people drink, drank, where they drank, and then the sort of the social relationships that are changed by uh, consumption of alcohol. Uh, for one thing, I get into the prohibition period, which was which which is very interesting from uh, uh, what happened in Boston. We hear about Chicago, we hear about New York, we don't hear a lot about about right. Boston. Um, I go back to the colonial period, where uh, many people drank hard cider and beer and yeah. ale, and taverns were um, social gathering spots where there were court court official court business was held in taverns because that was a really? prominent place, yes. Wow. And then we go way up into the saloon period and up to the current craft cocktail movement, which is something that Boston has been very much involved. I, I won't say we've led the charge, but we're right there in the yeah. top three right. in terms of really pushing this, looking at new ways nice. to, made, to make old drinks. Uh, the other thing I might mention yeah. is the, um, I did a co-authored with Beverly Ford, yes. the, the Boston Mob Guide, Hitman, Hoodlums, and Hideouts. Oh. And that is, uh, we've been, she and I have been following the Whitey Bulger trial yes. quite a bit. Uh, but that is another um, case where there's so many threads uh, of Boston. In fact, in all my books, it's very interesting because I can find similar threads through all of them. Some of the same people appear. King Solomon right. appears in the Coconut Grove books. He appears in Drinking Boston because he was a big bootlegger. And also in the Boston Mob Guide, because he was one of the original mob leaders in Boston. Right, right. So we try. I try to. I find these threads, and I follow where they lead. Yeah, and I see well, Boston on fire goes along that same right, right. same thread, uh, and then a couple little uh, newer subjects uh, or different subjects: the Brinks robbery. Brinks robbery. Uh, the Brinks robbery of Brinks 1950. Robbery. Uh, very fascinating case. It was very extraordinarily prominent in its day. It's a little bit forgotten today, except that the Brinks job, the movie starring Peter Falk, goes on the air every now and then. Yes. Um, and I've also written on the Boston Harbor Islands, yes, which, are, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, another subject. Lots of history um, on those islands. I encourage everyone to get out there and experience them for and themselves. And I, and I bet many Bostonians have never been there. It's one of those hidden jewels, as we say. Exactly. So, uh, exactly. That's, uh, that's excellent. Well, I want to thank you very much thank you. for being with us today, Stephanie. And uh, fascinating read, and uh, I'm sure our viewers will be quite, quite interested. Great. They say that much can be learned from history, and certainly one of the most important lessons of this tragic event is to never, ever let it happen again. And to that end of not letting future generations ever forget, 
I hope that many of our viewers will support the effort to build a permanent monument to this tragic event here in Boston. I'm Herb Fuchs, reporting about Boston.